Welcome back. China is the largest consumer of coal in the world. Coal, the most abundant energy source for China, generates about 70% of electricity for the country, but a continued reliance on coal certainly contributes to China's air pollution. 2013 was the smoggiest year in half a century. The Ministry of Environmental Protection says only three of 74 major Chinese cities managed to meet official minimum standards for air quality last year. State-owned companies like Shenhua, the world's largest coal company, are busy building what are called coal bases, huge industrial plants to convert coal into synthetic fuel that could make city air cleaner. But is that the whole story? Well, let's dig a little deeper. We're joined by Chip Jacobs and William Kelly, authors of Smog Town, the lung-burning history of pollution in Los Angeles. Their latest book is People's Republic of Chemicals. Welcome to The Heat. Terrific to be here. Good to be here. William, let me start with you, and let's look at the big picture here. When we talk about those figures, only three urban areas in China meeting uh, the minimum requirements set by the Ministry of Environmental Affairs as far as pollution is concerned. That's pretty frightening. Uh, what kind of impact will this have on the environment, and more importantly, on people, if this continues unchecked? Well, the Chinese uh, people are breathing the worst air that's ever been recorded in history. And... Uh, by all uh, measures, um, it's causing tremendous health impacts. Uh, the World Bank estimates that about a million or more people a year die prematurely due to air pollution, and of course, many more are sickened by it with things like asthma, chronic bronchitis, and uh, other type of respiratory ailments. And Chip, is the major culprit here coal, the burning of coal? It truly is. I think coal is represents 70 percent of uh, the way China electrifies itself. And coal, uh, as we're all learning, is releases an array of dangerous chemicals that both affect people on the ground as well as global warming. Um, there's been a raft of really interesting stories that have come out suggesting uh, up to a, a quarter a third of China's emissions are related to export manufacturing. Um, that's three billion tons of carbon dioxide, let alone particulate matter, um, heavy metals, and other things that really affect, uh, you know, the Chinese people uh, side to side. So it's a big deal having coal as your main source of energy. Right. So China is sitting on the cusp of a dilemma there. On the one hand, its economy is expanding. It's growing at a very fast rate. On the other hand, the quality of its air is just getting worse as this growth uh, continues. Uh, one of the uh, proposals being put forward is to turn coal into gas. It's being hailed as something that is environmentally friendly, um, that it transforms dirty coal into clean energy. Do you believe that to be true? Uh, well, there's no question that, that if, if uh, China builds uh, coal gasification plants, which it's doing in the inland areas away from the coast, which is the heavily populated area that is predominantly the source of, of air pollution right now in the nation, that it can, and then pipe that gas to those uh, cities and replace coal burning with that gas, you know, by changing the power plants to natural gas and other industries that it will cl help clean up the air along the coast. The problem with doing that, however, is that it emits about twice as much greenhouse gases as just burning the coal itself emits. So that you may be solving the air pollution problem, but it's worsening the global warming problem. Okay, Chip, go ahead. You wanted to say something? Uh, you know, it, it is a really interesting uh, proposal the Chinese government is pushing, just as Bill said, they are trying to bring clean air to their urbanizing population. People in the United States don't realize China has moved over 300 million people out of poverty. So uh, and as, as populations become middle class, expect better quality of life, demanding fresh air for themselves and their families is natural. But by moving and building these coal plants, plants one of which is the square footage of the size of Los Angeles, um, they are, it's a global warming dagger. China says, well, to the West, you're the ones that put us in this position in the first place, and they actually do have a point. Um, we exported a lot of our manufacturing there, so we have responsibility for w what's occurring. It's sort of like moving a checker around. 
but in the end, you can't escape the consequences. So I guess also in a sense, uh, you know, countries uh, like the United States have exported or outsourced a lot of their manufacturing to China, but they've also outsourced a lot of the pollution to China as well. That's true. Well, that's absolutely third true. Uh, yeah. William, go ahead. I'll do a oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Chip, you were saying. Go ahead. No, uh, it, it is true. You know, uh, there is um, cloud banks worth of pollution coming from China now hitting the American West Coast. A and the irony is, is as thick as the crummy air. Um, you can't really do away with pollution uh, if you don't change how you manufacture products. And, um, you know, it, it's going to be affecting tens of millions of people. So, William, if you look at it this way, uh, China's quest for clean air is going to doom climate change. We hope not. I mean, uh, around the world, I think that China has the opportunity, and if you've seen the news recently, to move much more aggressively on renewable energy as a replacement for coal and to uh, move toward um, uh, more electric vehicles, uh, hybrid vehicles, uh, to get away from the need for oil, and those vehicles ultimately could be charged with wind power or solar power. Uh, China has a lot of manufacturing capacity to produce uh, solar panels, uh, wind turbines. It's doing that. Uh, that could be ramped up, and China could go on a, a crash program and become a world leader on climate change very quickly. All it has to do is move in that direction rather than to continue to invest in coal. Right, so we know what the problem is and we know how serious the problem is. So where does one start trying to fix that, Chip? Uh, I think you start by having a rational policy in both the United States and China. One of the things that we discovered in our research and it blew our minds was in the 90s, as the United States, specifically the Clinton administration, was trying to bring China into the world of trading nations through the most favored nation status, uh, through the World Trade Organization, uh, um, there weren't environmental pr provisions uh, stopping China from going through a very polluting area just like America had. Um, amazingly, the U.S. government and international financial institutions that the U.S. government really runs roughshod over we were financing coal-based projects in China, even though we knew fully well these are incredibly contaminating for the atmosphere as well as smog. Something like $4.2 billion worth of U.S. government subsidies and others went to Chinese uh, coal plants and such. I mean, one was $800 million, went right into Shanxi province, which is the coal heart of China. So you, you can understand the Chinese government's interpretation of mixed signals from the U.S. On one hand, we are lecturing and moralizing about a clean environment. On the other hand, our, our government is backing projects that, that soil that same atmosphere. It, you know, it was a very confusing uh, message to the broadcast. Right, but given that, you know, both countries will have to be involved in a solution to this problem, William, do you find that there is the will on the part of the American side to, to get in and try and fix this? Well, no, I do not. I mean, I think that uh, the U.S. is having the same struggle right now over uh, how to go forward and deal with the climate change issue. Uh, basically, we burn a lot of coal in America, and right now uh, there's a struggle over whether to continue to do that or to replace that coal with cleaner sources of energy. And uh, you see the same uh, divisions here that you see in China, places, states that have a lot of coal, West Virginia, Wyoming, want to continue to exploit that, make money off of it. That's the basis of their economy. That's perfectly natural. The same is in China. You have some provinces that are doing a lot to, to clean up the air and to deal with climate change. Others, where coal is the major industry, that want to figure out how to keep uh, uh, advancing the use of coal, turning it into different products, fuels, gas, uh, and uh, that's a natural thing. Uh, so both societies are struggling, uh, and I think it's going to take cooperation between the two. Uh, we have a lot of technology here that we can offer, I think, to China to help, and China has a lot of manufacturing capacity 
to produce clean technologies uh, that could be put to work uh, on behalf, really, of both countries and the whole world. And we need to find that balance and strike that type of cooperation going forward. Chip, it wasn't that long ago that there were places in the United States that had very hazardous levels of pollution. One thinks of Los Angeles. But to some extent, uh, it's improved. And, and it's, that's a relative case. I mean, the air is marginally better now in Los Angeles than it used to be. The U.S. passed uh, laws like the U.S. Clean Air Act. But, you know, what was done at that point to improve conditions in a city like Los Angeles? I would say the number one thing that we did was use uh, the scientific method to understand the chemistry of atmospheric pollution and then to uh, pinpoint rules um, against very powerful industries uh, to clean up their products or they wouldn't be allowed to be sold. Um, it, the, the linchpin moment in Los Angeles's past was when we forced automakers to install catalytic converters on their cars. That greatly reduced their exhaust plumes and the smog that was clamping down on the city for 30, 40 years. They fought like heck against it, the automakers did, especially GM, but eventually uh, public will won out over corporate interest. And the air in Los Angeles today is 95% uh, even higher, cleaner. So there is, um, you know, there is an example for the Chinese government to follow uh, in good old Los Angeles. Um, but it does take a lot of will. And we know uh, there's a lot of complexity there. And it's, uh, their, their smog is primarily coal-based, although they're adding cars like crazy throughout China. It's the number one car market in the world. Um, but it really takes um, going to the biggest sources and making them realize it's in their national interest to change or their business is going to be uh, affected. Right. Chip, is there a recognition in a country like the United States that there is this need for cleaner energy, that it's urgent? Uh, I do think there is uh, a, a public will for it. But... Uh, we tend to live in the present, especially in, in fast-moving societies like the United States. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the motivations to clear up smog was that it was in people's faces. It was in their lungs. It was affecting their children. It was blotting their mountains and putting people in countless hospital wards with cancer and emphysema. Global warming, um, which is very related to clean air and the future of the world, isn't quite as um, obvious and as urgent an issue. Uh, in 25 years, it's going to be in everybody's lives. And uh, I keep going back to, in my own perspective, looking at what the Chinese can do to actually help the entire world. We went back in People's Republic of Chemicals to make our book different and study history to the extent we could and understand China's historic relationship with coal and the effects of foreign exploitation of China in the 1800s and 1900s. Uh, you know, China closed up kind of like a like an oyster. And while uh, the West was advancing with energy efficiency and new sources of, of energy, China was sticking with coal. And when China was opened up, it stayed with that same idea. And the world is, is paying for it. So there is a price of exploiting another country, as the United States is finding out and the world is finding out. Um, I, I would really hope the next generation of Americans and Chinese band together, forget about ideology in the past, and work to, to get clean air that technology will allow us to get. And that's where we have to leave this discussion. Chip Jacobs, William Kelly, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. We would love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and story ideas to theheat at cctv-america.com. Once again, that's theheat at cctv-america.com. I'm Arlen Vinado in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.